Okay, well, thank you so much for the invitation to speak. Thank you everybody for being here. Again, uh, I'm gonna, yeah, talk a little bit today about some uh, computer assisted proofs really involving boundary value problems. Uh, this is work with Maciek Kapinski and Shane Kepling. And uh, let, me, let me say first, like a little bit of a disclaimer. So when you're preparing a, a talk like this, uh, any talk, really, you're, you're always thinking in your head, you know, who, who's the audience? Who's going to be at the talk? Who am I talking to? And it's especially hard with these uh, online seminars, because literally anybody in the world could, could show up or nobody, right? So it's very hard to gauge who the audience is going to be. But I really enjoyed the talks last week. Uh, they were geared toward, you know, people who had a lot of experience in celestial mechanics or Hamiltonian systems, or mechanics in general, dynamical systems, but maybe didn't know so much about machine learning. And, and that's, that's me, right? So I had a chance to learn about uh, machine learning a little bit and see, see things that were going on in the intersection of celestial mechanics and machine learning. So I really tried to imitate that with this talk. You know, I'm really thinking my, my audience is somebody who has a strong background in uh, uh, celestial mechanics and maybe has done a lot of numerical simulations and is interested in and, you know, how are people or how could one turn some of this uh, numerical intuition into rigorous uh, proofs? Um, or maybe people who've done a lot of uh, have nice perturbation results uh, in celestial mechanics and are interested in, you know, how could they uh, uh, extend some of those results to more realistic parameters and things like this. So, <clears throat> Anybody in the audience who's written a paper on computer assisted proof is probably going to be a little bit bored and even maybe frustrated during this talk, but uh, it's because I'm, I'm not really, that's not who I was imagining I was talking to when I wrote this. So uh, it, it, this is hopefully more for a general background. Okay, so with that disclaimer out of the way, let's uh, jump in. So <clears throat> even within the context of uh, computer assisted proof and celestial mechanics, there's a million things you could try to do. So let me sort of talk about what's the framework that, that, that I want to be in today. And it's really the uh, kind of the program of, of Poincaré, right? So suppose we have some Hamiltonian system, we fix an energy level, what kind of questions might we ask, right? And we can really start to try to build from low level dynamics build up to understand more and more the system, right? So the first question we might ask is, where are the equilibrium solutions or the, the libration points of the system? How many are there? Where are they located, right? What are their stabilities? Uh, after understanding this question, we next might move to periodic orbits. Where are the periodic orbits in the energy section? Well, there may be infinitely many, so this is too hard to answer, but if we sort of restricted ourselves to uh, periodic orbits of period less than some bound, well, we could start counting and start looking for things, right? And after this, okay, what about quasi-periodic solutions? And, and you go up and up, right? Uh, where, you know, are there some interesting normally hyperbolic invariant manifolds more general than uh, quasi-periodic solutions? And you start to find these interesting spots in the phase space, right? These hot spots. In celestial mechanics, you quite possibly also have some uh, dangerous spots, right? You have some collision manifolds. So in configuration space, maybe in a restricted problem, you think of a collision as a point, you, your orbit's going to a bad point, but when you think in the phase space, that collision is, is probably a full manifold of, uh, of bad, uh, bad points, right? And you'd like to know where those are, of course. And once you know those things, you could start to ask about connections between them, right? So are, are there heteroclinic connections between equilibria, right? Maybe homoclinic connections from an equilibria to itself. Same kinds of questions for periodic orbits, right? And then can different objects connect to each other, right? What about going from one of these objects to collision or from collision ejecting from a collision and hitting an invariant object? or even ejecting from a collision and coming back to yourself, right? All these kinds of questions are, are building up your, your roadmap, right? Uh, uh, of, of understanding the, the dynamics, right? And what can happen. And this, uh, you know, this roadmap is 
even better, you know, it would be great if I just knew where a bunch of invariant sets were and how to connect them. What's really great about this program is you, you get more than this, right? Is as soon as you have invariant objects plus connections, uh, you get more information, right? And again, everybody knows this, right? So I'm not telling you anything new. In fact, the Machek's talk was also all about this. I'm just, just trying to, to talk about the kinds of things that I'm, I like to think about in terms of trying to do computer assisted proofs. So invariant objects plus connections gives me a lot more, right? And, and examples of this and go all the way back to Poincaré. So the, the uh, proof that the re restricted problem is, is not integrable. This fundamentally used some periodic orbits and connecting orbits between them uh, to cause a certain series to diverge so that you knew you couldn't be integrable, right? And then the same kind of construction goes into the smale tangle theorem to say that instead of ruling something out, saying something's not integrable, you're trying to say, well, I have something, I have chaotic dynamics. So if I look there at gamma two in the picture, the fact that there's this orbit that leaves gamma two and then comes back, this tells me not only do I have a connection from gamma two to itself, but if that connection is transverse, then I also have uh, chaotic dynamics. I have you know, infinitely many periodic orbits nearby and sensitive dependence on initial conditions and symbolic dynamics and so forth. They have really rich dynamics as soon as I have that picture at gamma two, right? And there are other, I, maybe you can't, uh, right now I can't see my picture of, uh, of uh, P2 where I had this homo clinic, but there are other kinds of forcing theorems, you know, that, that, that homo clinic orbits, uh, even for equilibrium solutions can force chaotic behavior in Hamiltonian systems. I'll come back to that later. And then of course, these things go up the tower, right? You can have chains of invariant tori and normally hyperbolic invariant manifolds. And if things fit together, right, you have all kinds of symbolic dynamics. Again, this really goes back to Machek's talk just a few minutes ago as well. Um, so building simple objects and then connecting them is really a great way to get information in a, a, a dynamical system, especially a Hamiltonian system. Okay, so that's like a goal, right? How to start in on this goal? Well, the, the approach I'm gonna take today, since I knew Machek was gonna focus more on topological tools, I'm going to uh, talk a little more about sort of functional analytic tools. So the approach I wanna take is that uh, these basic invariant manifolds equal solving some equations. Okay, so uh, maybe algebraic equations, differential equations, even PDEs, some very hard PDEs in some of these cases. So just the simplest example in the world. An equilibrium solution is, of course, just a zero of a vector field. I'm just trying to solve that equation, uh, f of x equals zero. Periodic orbits, it's very simple. I'm looking for gamma prime minus f of gamma equals zero. Uh, but now I want gamma to be not a point, but a function with period greater than zero. So I can solve that equation to study periodic orbits. And for quasi-periodic orbits, it's a little bit less obvious, but I can study this uh, PDE, right? That says that the dynamics on the PDE are conjugate to just linear dynamics on the torus with the irrationally related frequencies. That's sort of the geometric content of that uh, equation, but it's still, it's an equation that we can try to study. It's a, it's a PDE and actually people in this audience know it's a pretty tough PDE, but it's a PDE that describes an invariant torus. Okay, linearization, I'm solving some equations. Stable and unstable manifolds. This, this is something I'll come back to later in the talk. Again, the local stable unstable manifold of an equilibrium solution, let's say just the, uh, just the stable, right? It solves some equation. If I have a D-dimensional stable manifold, I actually have an equation that looks a lot like the equation for a torus, but the setup is different, so the equation is much nicer. Instead of just having the frequencies times derivatives, I have frequencies times the variable times the derivative. This makes things makes this a nicer equation. And instead of solving a, on periodic boundary conditions, I really have like almost initial data. So you want that uh, this P, which is meant to parameterize your say stable manifold, that it takes uh, the origin in some parameter space to the fixed point, that it's tangent at the origin to the eigenspace, 
and then that it solves this PDE. And if you, if you have all of that, then you have parameterized stable or unstable manifold. So just, you know, I don't think I've taught anything by saying that. If, if people have seen this before, they, they know what I mean. If people haven't seen it before, it might not be so clear. But the point I'm trying to make is that getting my hands on a stable and un or unstable manifold is solving some equation. This is really all I'm trying to get at. And there are similar equations for linearizing about these various objects. So I wrote equations for linearizing at an equilibrium solution. If you linearize at a periodic orbit or at a torus, uh, you have also some equations that, that you're trying to solve. The same is true of the connecting orbits, right? I can think of a, a connecting orbit as a, a boundary value problem. So, or actually uh, uh, a, um, I could connect stable and unstable manifolds of invariant objects. I could also try to connect to collision sets. So, you know, if you just write down a homoclinic orbit, for example, at say this fixed point P0, I'm looking for a solution of the differential equation that exists for all time, that limits in backward time to the equilibrium and in forward time back to the equilibrium. So this seems like a problem on an unbounded domain initially, which is pretty tough. Uh, but if you use the stable and unstable man manifolds, of course, you get now a finite time boundary value problem. So you're just looking for uh, something that in time t solves the differential equation on just a compact interval, whose initial condition is on the unstable manifold, final condition on the stable manifold. And that's a nice finite time boundary value problem. And of course, okay, you could change, uh, you know, you could go from P1 to P2, it's the same story, or from uh, gamma two to P1, you know, it, it doesn't matter which manifolds you're connecting. If you have those manifolds, you can try to do boundary value problems to connect them. The boundary value problem is just another equation that you wanna solve. So all of this uh, Poincaré program, can be rethought of as solving um, it's a resolve, uh, solving different equations. So this is just like recapping the, the, the first few minutes here, right? We, we want to solve uh, some equations to compute invariant sets, some boundary value problems to compute connecting orbits. And if we can do that, then we force some other dynamical consequences. Um, and here by compute, I really mean rigorously, right? So if you want to obtain the dynamical forcing as rigorous theorems, then your computation needs to be also a rigorous theorem. So you can start, you know, you, you have all of the tools of numerical analysis and scientific computing to approximately solve these equations, right? The computer never solves anything, right? Or maybe maybe if you're doing some, some uh, programs in algebra or something, you, you get exact solutions. But typically when you do numerical analysis, you don't solve problems, you approximately solve them. And then you try to manage your mistakes and be as smart about them as, as you can be. Um, so numerical analysis and scientific computing is like just handed to you as the, the, the this incredibly powerful set of tools for pr producing approximate solutions. In computer-assisted proof, we want to take an approximate solution and pass to a true solution, right? So uh, now this becomes a question about your equations, about your nonlinear equations. Which equations, or does the equation you're interested in have the property that a good enough approximate solution implies the existence of a true solution uh, nearby? And uh, it's really kind of a incredible fact that any equations have this property, right? That, that you could approximately solve it and then look at your approximate solution and conclude that you have a true solution nearby. But somehow this is very much a theme of nonlinear analysis, right? So I wanna talk about a, um, a theorem for doing this. I wanna introduce a theorem it's like moderately general that would let you attack a lot of these kinds of problems. This is, and this is just a newton kantorovich theorem with like some tiny tweaks that make it um, a little more accessible for, for, for working with the computer. So let's say we have a smooth map. 
between Bonnock spaces, X and Y. And we have an approximate solution of this smooth map that we got anywhere, right? Maybe, but, but, but maybe through some numerical calculation. So we have an approximate solution. What other ingredients do I need for this particular theorem? I need an approximation of my derivative and my approximate solution. Uh, and yeah, okay, I, 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 I need this. Um, and I want it to be an isomorphism, but the spaces don't have to be the same. So that's not as uh, delicate um, an assumption as it seems like. So I need to be able to approximate my derivative. And then I need to be able to approximate the inverse of my approximate derivative. So this all starts to sound like things you could maybe do on a computer. I can't ever solve an equation, but I could approximately solve it. And I can't actually find the derivative, but I could approximate the derivative. I can't actually even invert a matrix on the computer, but I can approximately invert it very, very well, right? So these are the kinds of uh, ingredients here. So if I have these things, uh, is there a true solution near my approximate solution? So here's a theorem that's gonna allow me to say uh, yes, and even to bound the distance between my approximate and true solutions and give uniqueness even. So suppose everything I just said, I have this uh, differentiable map, I have a, a point in my space, I have these two operators, one approximating the derivative, the other approximating the inverse. And now I have uh, three numbers and one function, just all scalar quantities, right? Uh, these three positive numbers need to be related like this. So this, this y zero, I want this to be just a bound on my defect. So this is a measurement of how good is my uh, approximate solution. The z zero is a defect on my, how good a job I did at inverting my approximate derivative. So a dagger is my approximate derivative, a is an approximate inverse. If a were really the inverse of a dagger, this would be zero. But if I made mistakes, this will be something not zero, hopefully small. Another defect, how good, how well does a dagger approximate my actual derivative? I need to be able to make this measurement. And these are all just point-wise. These all happen at uh, x bar a or a dagger. So there's nothing sort of uh, involving the space really here. These are just measurements at sort of points in either the function space or the operator space. Now I need a little bit of local control. So I wanna say, if I, if I take some ball about my approximate solution, I need like a Lipschitz bound on the first derivative. Okay, it's sort of uh, preconditioned by A. Uh, and I want this to really go to zero as uh, X bar, excuse me, as X went to my approximate solution. So I'm writing this in a way where I've sort of somehow been able to factor an R out of this, and then I have maybe some function of R left. Okay, if I have these things, then I put them together in a certain way. I put them into this, uh, if Z were constant or if Z were Z2 were a polynomial, this would be a polynomial equation. If not, it's some transcendental equation that's uh, polynomial-ish. So I build this scalar function. It's a function from R, uh, the, the variable R into the real number. So now this is just a 1D thing. And if I can find a little R, that makes this P negative, then there's a unique true solution of my problem in the ball of radius R. So this gives me just perfectly uh, conditions for um, being able to conclude that I have a true solution and actually giving me bounds on, on, on where the true solution is relative to the approximate solution. Okay, um, I think I'll, so I have the proof of this here in the slides. I think I will kind of just say a word or two about it rather than going carefully through it. The main thing I wanna convince you of is there's nothing fancy in this theorem. I'm not hiding anything really in this theorem. This is just a, like a little bit of, uh, it's very close to the proof of the implicit function theorem. We just look at a uh, Newton-like operator. So we define this T. So F goes from X to Y, A goes from Y back to X. So now we have a, something that goes from X to X. And we wanna to try to prove that it's a contraction. First, you can look at its derivative. Okay, its derivative is easy to compute and manage. So you start trying to bound its derivative. 
and you see that you have, by adding and subtracting things, you get a nice estimate on the derivative in terms of things you know here. If this P is negative, then you adjust things a little bit and you see that this, this bound you have on the derivative must actually be less than one. Okay, so uh, these, this PR is, is encoding that information about the derivative, okay, that it must be, uh, that we kind of have a contraction. We have a, a bound on the derivative on this ball. And then you pick something in your ball and look at where it maps. You add and subtract T bar, and then you start looking at what you have here. The first term is just your defect. The second term you bound with a, um, a mean value inequality. And you, you start getting right back toward this uh, PR, which you know, uh, all I did is I took the, the uh, negative R here. So we have the one, the minus one times R, you move it to the other side. And now you have that the ball is mapping inside itself. Okay, so th this is what I'm trying to say. It's, it's not so much that you follow every step of this proof. It's just that you see that there's, there's nothing really uh, fancy happening here. It's just the contraction mapping theorem. Okay, and then when you have that uh, estimate on the derivative, that of course gives you a contraction constant. Okay, so again, that's just going very quickly through this proof, just trying to see that, uh, that really what's happening here is the contraction mapping theorem. Okay, so let's take this theorem and uh, do something with it. And the, the first thing I wanna do with it has nothing to do with computer assisted proof at all. And so I, I, again, I'm, I'm kind of trying to, uh, to shake hands with people a little bit and say that that what's really happening here is implicit function theory, which which everybody is is you know uh, comfortable with, right? So let me use this theorem to do just a uh, a really simple argument, like uh, exercise one in a, a perturbation uh, result. Okay, so. And there's a reason I'm doing this, and you'll see you'll see by the end. It's not just to show that this theorem can can be used to do a lot of things. I, I really want to try to make a point about computer assisted proofs. But let's let's look at the example, and you'll you'll see what I mean as we go. So suppose now we have a map, and we want to show it has a zero. So maybe we're trying to prove the existence of an equilibrium solution. Uh, excuse me. We already have the part of my assumption here is that I have a zero and that the derivative there is invertible. So I'm going to try to perturb this map. Now I'm going to look at a perturbation. So my capital F is going to be little f plus epsilon h. And I'm going to assume everything in sight is bounded. Okay, so I know I'm assuming I'm trying to do an easy exercise where there won't be lots of details. Okay, so I have a very nice perturbation here and I have some bound on the second derivative even of the little f. Okay. Now I want to prove uh, that there's an R and a delta. So as long as epsilon is less than delta, I have a unique solution of my big F, my perturbed problem, okay, in that ball. So just a little perturbation theory argument, right? But for I have a zero of little f, I want to say if I turn on epsilon, I still get a zero of the, of the perturbed system. Okay, so how to do it? I'm going to try to use this, this newton kantorovich type theorem over here, right? So the, the main idea is let's treat the true solution of my unperturbed system as an approximate solution of my perturbed system. I need an approximate solution. So this is where I get one. Right? Now I, I have the derivative here. I want an approximate derivative. So I'll just take it to be the actual derivative of my unperturbed system also. Okay. So my A dagger in this, in this newton kantorovich theorem over here, it's just the derivative of the unperturbed system. And that's gonna approximate the derivative of the perturbed system. Now, since I assumed things were invertible and since I'm not doing anything on, on a computer, I'll just take A to be the actual inverse of this approximate derivative. So this I'm pretending I can do exactly. So then if I start to look at these things I need to estimate, I need to look at A big F at P zero. Okay, so I plug in the formula for big F, and of course, little f of p vanishes, and I do the triangle, oh, I put equal, that should be less than or equal. I do the triangle inequality, and I just get this bound, right? 
So I take this to be my y zero, that absolute value of epsilon times the norm of a times this bound on, on h. That's the y zero up here for my theorem. My z zero is zero because I, I took the actual inverse of a dagger. So there's nothing in there. What about my a dagger minus the true derivative? Well, again, I just plug in the formula for the true derivative. I get a little bit of cancellation. I do the uh, triangle inequality and I'll take Z1 to be this quantity. And lastly, okay, to bound the, to get a Lipschitz bound on the derivative, I'll just use the second derivative. Uh, so I, I look at the formulas, I add and subtract, uh, separate things, use the uh, mean value inequality and I have a bound like this. Okay, so using the triangle inequality, again, putting the A in there, I can say that the soup that I need for my theorem is less than this explicit quantity. Okay, so putting everything together, those are my Y, Z0, Z1, and Z2. Notice my Z2, it's allowed to be a, a function of R, but in this case, it's just a constant function. This is for, for so I could say Z2 of R is just this, right? Okay, so you build your polynomial, and now I want to say that there's a little r that makes this polynomial negative. So why why is that true? Well, again, it's like a it's a little it's an epsilon is small. There exists an epsilon small enough kind of argument. So look at uh, p of r. If I evaluate p at zero, you look at that formula. I just get y is zero. Okay, so. Uh, p, it's actually in this case, just a quadratic uh, equation. It goes through the y-axis right at y zero. And if I take the derivative of p, I see that that's just uh, two z two r minus one minus z. If I evaluate that at zero, it's just negative one minus z. If I take epsilon small enough, I can make this as close to minus one as I want. So I can make y zero small. I can make that slope as close to one as I want by taking epsilon small. So I have this parabola, which might curve away from the tangent line very fast if, for example, K2 is really, really big. But by taking epsilon small enough, I can force this thing to hit the x-axis and I'll have an interval where there are negative Rs, okay? So what am I showing? I'm showing there exists a delta so that for any epsilon less than that, I have negative, uh, I have values of R so that PR is negative. Okay, so that gives me the conclusion. So again, it's a there exists epsilon kind of kind of thing. Okay, great. Just a little little perturbation analysis using this newton kantorovich theorem. What do I want to say about this? Uh, I assume more than I needed. I can get rid of most of those assumptions, right? I could do this just on a ball around the approximate solution instead of on all of R, and it just I have to make more. I have to you know say more technical things. That's, that's, it's easy to localize. So uh, a nice thing to say about this is the smallest root of P gives me the best error bound, but the biggest root gives me something else too, right? It gives me isolation of the uh, solution. So, so I, I get uh, ex existence and I get very small error bounds, but if I understand the roots of P, uh, then I might also get a, a, a good sized neighborhood where I've got a unique solution, where I've got some isolation, which can be useful later. Now, this is the thing uh, I, I really want to stress, right? This is the point of doing this exercise. Why did I need an exact solution of the unperturbed system? It was so that I could get an approximate solution of the perturbed system. So the thing I really need is an approximate solution of the perturbed system. That, that's kind of what's driving the whole uh, discussion. So uh, if in a computer assisted proof, when I'm trying to do something like this, um, the approximate solution comes from numerics. And instead of adjusting the epsilon, what you try to do is adjust the quality of your approximation. Use finer mesh sizes, use, uh, you know, all the tricks from uh, all the tricks, all the tools of numerical analysis to make your approximation as good as you need it to be to get this uh, argument to go through. But it, it, it's very classical in that sense. You know, there's sort of nothing mysterious about the, sometimes when people say here are computer assisted proof, they think the computer is doing some uh, logic or some chess tree or something like this. And there are computer assisted proofs like that, but that's not what I'm talking about at all. 
what I'm talking about here, all of the reasoning, you know, all of the uh, the estimates and the, the thinking is really coming from the person, uh, from the mathematician, and the computer is assisting in doing some uh, some part of the construction where it can where it can do a lot of computations. Okay. Okay, so this uh, this Newton Kantorovich theorem, you know, this you could as another exercise. This is something I like to uh, have students do when I'm teaching things like this. You could actually prove the implicit function theorem just using this Newton Kantorovich theorem. It's very much what we're doing here is implicit function theory. Um, of course, this little theorem that I've just shown you isn't enough to do everything. For example, if you're trying to do KAM, you need e even fancier modifications of this, where you, you know, you have a map from F to Y, and you have a, a, an approximate inverse that doesn't take you all the way back into Y, into X, right? So you you lose something when you apply F and the approximate inverse. So then you have to do these iterative Nash-Moser procedures. But still, morally, it, it's it's a lot like uh, what we're what, what what we're talking about here. Okay, so let's do the same thing again, but now to prove a computer-assisted theorem, right? Let's see what it looks like to really do something simple. So I want to do again something pretty um, elementary. Just prove the existence of a equilibrium solution and kind of figure out where it is with some bounds and an uh, equilateral restricted four body problem. So this is where I have three massive bodies on a, a Lagrangian triangle. You change to rotating coordinates. So these become singularities of the vector field, which is now not time varying. And um, you have a massless particle moving in the field, okay? And you study the dynamics in the massless part of the massless particle. The first question you could ask, going back to the first slide of the talk, is where are the equilibrium solutions? Okay, so here's the vector field. Um, you know, you, you have these three gravitational terms with these, uh, uh, you know, distance to the, uh, or the, the, the radius to the minus three has power kind of nonlinearity. This is, you know, standard uh, kind of model in celestial mechanics. And as there's, this was studied by uh, Carlos Simo, very nice paper in 1977 that numerically strongly suggested that this system always has, depending on the mass ratios, it might have eight, it might have nine, or it might have 10 equilibrium solutions. Always these, no, never 20, uh, never five, right? Uh, but the fact that this was uh, not proved suggests you know, that there's something a lot more challenging going on here than in the, say, the restricted three-body problem where you can kind of work everything out by hand. Um, so, you know, those equilibrium solutions, what usually happens is you, not usually, what always happens is you have six on the outside of the triangle, one sort of near the line bisecting each of these sides, and then you have uh, three more sort of pushed away from the from from the masses. So I'm going to try to look for one that's kind of across from N1, like I'm drawing here in the picture. And, and then you have either two, three, or four equilibria inside the triangle. So all of the interesting stuff happens inside the triangle. There's always six outside. OK, so if you want an equilibrium, this is what you have to solve, the vector field equal to 0. Two of these equations go away, and you're left with just a problem in R2. Uh, so this is, you know, almost the easiest kind of problem we could try to do with computer-assisted uh, proof after one-dimensional. And um, so this is the problem. We want a zero of this little function f. And I can take an initial guess based on that picture of maybe x equal one, y equals zero. I think somewhere around there, there's probably going to be an equilibrium. Okay, so I need to pick some mass values. And as soon as I pick those mass ratios, the locations of x1, x2, x3, y1, y2, y3, those become completely uh, explicit. So I just have now formulas. I have completely explicit formulas that I'm working with. So I can, um, I can use Newton's method to try to find an approximate solution. Okay, so let's say I do this. And this is what I get for these mass ratios. So it's sure enough, it's not so far from my one comma zero. Uh, Newton finds me something nice, something to 16 figures. Um, 
I'll take that now as my approximate solution of the problem. So if I look at my newton kantorovich theorem, this X bar, Y bar is what I called X bar over here in the theorem. I can numerically compute the uh, derivative. I just have formulas for that. Again, Machek talked a little bit about uh, interval arithmetic. This part of the calculation, I don't need any intervals or anything. I just numerically compute an approximate derivative. And then I numerically compute its inverse. Uh, in two dimensions like this, of course, you have formulas for the inverse, but forget that. In more dimensions, you'll just, you'll do numerical linear algebra to compute A. Of course, you get a very good approximate inverse, but not the inverse. Okay, now I'm gonna measure the quality of these things. I need to specify a norm. So why am I showing you the norms I wanna use? I just want you to see that there's just formulas that you put into your computer that do these things, right? So the norm of a vector, I'll take maybe just the max of the absolute value of the components. That induces a norm on the matrices, which is just, I sum the columns and take the max over the rows. And then even on, since it's gonna be a second derivative at some point, I need to uh, specify a norm on bilinear forms. Well, this is the induced norm uh, from choosing that original norm on the vector space. So these are just things I can put in the computer. And anytime you give me a vector, I can, I can compute its norm. If I do things with interval arithmetic, I'll get actually a rigorous enclosure, like Machek was saying in his talk. Same for norms on matrices and even norms on, on higher order tensors. So this is all just, you know, the machine doing its thing, but with being careful about the rounding so that you get rigorous enclosures. Okay, so, you know, let, let, let's look at some of them. The first thing I need to, okay, well, I can compute the a bound on the norm of this matrix. It's just that formula from the previous slide with these numbers in it. And then since it's positive numbers and you're just adding them, you just always round things up and then you get a bound like this. Okay, uh, for the defect, it's a little more complicated. I need to take this X bar and Y bar and plug them into that formula for F. And now I have to do all kinds of things, divisions, roots, powers. Again, this was like Machek suggested. This is now, there's a little bit of software development to be able to evaluate all these formulas correctly in intervals, but there are libraries for managing that. So if I do that, if I plug this X and Y into that F, I get a vector out, which I can then hit with the matrix A. I still have a vector. And uh, this is the interval vector that I, that I get as a result. I can plug that into the formula for the norm and I get a very small uh, bound. I get a Y zero here, which bounds my uh, A times F of X bar. Okay, okay. And now I just do the same thing. I'll go a little faster, you know, for these matrices, I check that defect. Um, I get this Z zero this time. It's not zero, but it's again, it's quite small. I check the difference between my approximate derivative and my true derivative. This time I need to evaluate that DF actually with intervals and then look at its difference in interval arithmetic from a dagger. Again, I get something quite small. And if I just compute all of the second partials of this uh, F, then I can bound the second derivative. Here I localize, okay? I take a ball of radius 10 to the minus six about uh, X bar and Y bar in that norm, which is just the, um, it just gives me a product of intervals. So now on just a big box, I evaluate all the second, well, big, it's 10 to the minus six, this box, but on a box of size 10 to the minus six about X bar and Y bar, I just evaluate all these second derivatives. You can see, I get an interval enclosure here. That's not so tight. It's, you know, it's about 10 wide. So I'm making a lot of round off errors because I took a big box to evaluate all these formulas, but I still get a rigorous enclosure of that second derivative. I can use the triangle inequality uh, to, to multiply by that bound that I have on the norm of A. And then I can take Z2 to be this number. I should have actually written that Z2 is this number for all R less than 10 to the minus six. This number only makes sense on the ball where I localized. Okay, but this is that Z2 bound. It's a constant, but where I have to keep in mind that, it, that I'm only allowed to look at R's now less than or equal to 10 to the minus six. Okay, so now I have my approximate solution, my approximate derivative, my approximate inverse, and I have all these numbers 
Now I just need to apply this theorem. So you build this, this time it's actually just a polynomial. I can find its uh, roots. I can intersect with the ball of 10 to the minus six and take the something a little bit bigger than the uh, smallest root because I want things to be less than zero, not equal to zero. So I get that for all R in this interval, I actually have a true solution. And the difference between the true and approximate solution is uh, smaller than three times 10 to the minus 15th, which is about 10 machine epsilons, uh, roughly. So, you know, in doing this calculation and then doing the proof, we, we've, we've lost a little bit. We, we're not quite at the accuracy of the computer, but, but quite close, okay? Okay, so that's two examples of, of using this uh, theorem. So, you know, now you have to use your imagination a little bit, but there's nothing fundamentally different if you uh, want to use this for a uh, infinite dimensional problem. Of course, all of the estimates are more, right? You have a numerical part now that you'll do on the computer, but then you're also estimating truncation errors and, and things like this. But it's, it's you know, you're, you, again, you're using your tools from analysis and from uh, numerical analysis to uh, quite classical tools to bound things. So there's nothing very mysterious, even when you're doing something uh, uh, much more complicated than finding a zero of a 2D map, which is all I've talked about really. So I have some references here. If people were interested in this and wanted to like go off and look at other things, um, there's this uh, review article of Yam Bao and John Philippe in uh, notices from a few years ago that really focuses on uh, on dynamical systems, you know, computer assisted proof and dynamical systems and the, the kind of historical development and what's been done. There's a very nice article by uh, Javier focusing more on PDEs that's a little bit more recent. And then I also mentioned this book that Machik mentioned, Warwick Tucker's Validated Numerics book, which is a great place for starting to actually like do this stuff. Okay, so that's like a, a crash course in sort of uh, an analytic approach to computer-assisted proof, right? Just like a, an idea of what is it, how does it work? What, what, are you, what are people thinking about? What are they doing? So now I wanna turn, the time I have left, I wanna talk um, just about computers in celestial mechanics and, and see that it's really natural somehow that uh, computer assisted proof would, would appear in celestial mechanics is, is kind of a strong tool is because computations have been so much a part of the field always. Um, so not going all the way back to Newton, just uh, back to say Poincaré, uh, and sort of the beginning of the qualitative theory, tying back to the beginning of the talk. Uh, I want to focus a little bit on, on kind of uh, periodic orbits for a minute, talking about periodic orbits and computing periodic orbits. So there's this quote, quote from Poincaré, which I, I, I really uh, like, and I won't read the whole thing, but if, if you're reading it, let me just kind of summarize. It's basically saying it, it first, on first thought, it seems like periodic orbits are a silly thing to study because there's no chance you'll ever see a periodic orbit in a, a Hamiltonian system. Um, so so why, why so much focus on periodic orbits? And he, he, you know, he says that periodic orbits uh, end up being the, the key that lets us open the door through which we were unable to enter before. So, so they're a key for understanding so many things, even if uh, they're not sort of like what you really see when you look at the moon or what you really see when you look at some asteroid. You're always a little away from periodic orbit, but the periodic orbits are helping us understand things. And of course, this was like a call to action uh, for uh, many scientists at the time. And almost immediately, uh, literature began to appear on actually computing periodic orbits, meaning with, with calculations, because this celestial mechanics problems are, are so challenging. 
it, it can be, you know, of course you can do perturbation uh, methods and you understand the periodic orbits and say the two body problem, it lets you pass to the three body with a small third mass and things like this. But, you know, as you start to get away from the perturbative setting, it becomes more challenging to follow these things. So there's a, a paper as early as 1897 by uh, George Darwin, who was uh, the, the actually the son of Charles. And there's George in his study. And here's this paper I'm talking about, periodic orbits. And there's, a, the, the, there's something in the introduction that when I first read it, I really... Uh, it really uh, hit me, you know, he's basically saying, you know, there's great interest attached to these periodic orbits, so thanks to Poincaré, which is what he's been talking about before this. And uh, even though they're very interesting, there's, it's hard to find them in general. And often you, you uh, are forced to do some numerics, which is a lot of work, right? And remember, he's working in 1897, so this is really a lot of work. And he, he says, this is what I, what I really enjoy. He's almost apologizing for, for, for the work. He's saying, it's not for me to say whether the labor I've undertaken can be justified, but I've been led on by my interest. And I think now that the work is done, you'll find it interesting. And I, I, I've just felt this way myself uh, when you're, you're doing some numerical calculations and you get so involved in what you're in and you continuation with respect to this and continuation with respect to that. And then when you step back and you write it up, you're like, oh gosh, I hope someone's going to find this interesting. You know? and, and to see this written so honestly I, 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 at the beginning of the, the, the field, I, I, really, I really like this. Uh, another thing he says in the introduction, which uh, is wonderful, is there's a thank you to the uh, granting society for money for computers, uh, computing resources. But here the computing resources are... Uh, uh, Mr. Allnut and uh, and Mr. Craig and Mr. Barry and himself. Uh, so I think this is the first uh, site, you know, thank you to a granting agency for computational resources that I've ever seen in a paper, but this is something that we, we all write in our papers uh, all the time. So there's a lot of things, you know, he, he does numerical calculations, all the things that, 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 that we all do, still do today, you know, uh, the Hills regions, and then he does some numerical integrations and showing that Things pass from a neighborhood of uh, Jupiter to a neighborhood of the sun and what it looks like to hit the hills region and all these kinds of things. And then he moves to periodic orbits and he starts showing families of periodic orbits, so the planar Lyapunov orbits. Then he even has a picture here that, that looks like the one that, that Machek showed us uh, on, the, on the bottom where we have some orbit that's uh, going from a planar Lyapunov and makes an excursion around the, the Jupiter and then comes back to the planar Lyapunov. I mean, there's a suggestion there of a, of a homoclinic tangle already in this, uh, these calculations. Okay, and they see, as he said, he does, he did a lot, did a lot of work on this. This thing is 145 pages. And at the end, there's a lot of results reported. But it's, uh, it, it's really the, the, the starting place, I think, of this meeting between, you know, the geometric methods that Poincaré was talking about, and then the, the numerical methods that look for these objects in actual systems. Um, I think I better jump ahead just a little bit. I, ha I had more to say about the Moulton and the Stromgerns group at, at Copenhagen. Uh, the thing that I'll just say quickly about Stromgern and, and the work of his group, okay, this was in now the, the you know, 19, early 1900s to the 1930s, is that they focused on numerical continuation and following periodic families from their birth to their death. So here's a, a planar Lyapunov family. You see it growing around L2 here and ending in like an ejection collision orbit with the second mass. So they were very interested in these kinds of questions about the, the birth and death of periodic families. Okay, and they studied bifurcations as well. But in this work, they actually discovered some um, interesting new objects, which are what they called asymptotic periodic orbits. These are periodic orbits with finite bounded amplitude, but infinitely long period. So, you know, today we call these uh, homoclinic orbits. So here are several uh, to L4 when the masses are for equal mass case, okay? And uh, 
again, these were discovered by following families of periodic orbits. Again, I'm going a little bit fast now. Uh, there's Zebheli, when the computer was invented, he and his group started refining these Stromgern calculations, going back to them, doing them with the computer, and now kind of as accurate as you would want. And of course, now it takes minutes instead of decades. Um, but here's this actual picture from one of Zebheli's uh, students and collaborators at Yale of the, the, this family that comes up out of L1 in the equal mass problem. And you, you follow by continuation this planar family and eventually it ends in a homoclinic orbit at L4. So this is now like a numerical conjecture, right? It is, is, are these things actually there? And of course, these are great numerics. So we believe, yes, this is for sure there, but you would still like to be able to prove these kinds of things. Okay, so, you know, can you have a tube of periodic orbits which actually accumulates to a homoclinic? Okay, this is now called a blue sky catastrophe, discovered numerically first, right? So, for example, does this happen in the circular restricted three-body problem? Well, we have, you know, numerical evidence that says, yes, this happens, okay? But maybe you want to prove it. Um, one, one, one more thing to say with regards to the forcing, you know, after all of this beautiful numerical work, the mathematicians really got interested in this and got involved and proved some nice forcing theorems. So there's a theorem from 1973 from Hennard that says, if you have a saddle focus equilibrium, so you have complex conjugate eigenvalues in a 4D Hamiltonian vector fields at an equilibrium solution, so you have 2D stable, 2D unstable, but with the spiraling. If you have a homoclinic a transverse in the energy manifold, if you have a homoclinic orbit, then there is a tube of periodic orbits that accumulates to it. So in other words, you have this Stromgren picture as soon as you have a uh, homoclinic orbit. And then a couple of years later, Devaney uh, expanded on this and said, okay, not only do you have this tube connecting, coming, rising to your energy level of the homoclinic, but in the energy level of the homoclinic, you have rich dynamics. You have uh, chaotic dynamics, you know, shadowing this, this uh, homoclinic orbit. So it's kind of nice. And it's like a Hamiltonian version of Sitnikov, um, but there's no bifurcation parameter. And it's sort of like a Smale theorem, but it's not for periodic orbits. It's for just equilibrium solutions. It's a nice, simple kind of setting where you can get chaotic uh, dynamics. Okay, so let me finally get to uh, you know, the, the topic of this talk, which is, can we prove this in the circular restricted three-body problem? And uh, the, the short answer is, is we can, and we do it kind of the way that I've, I've been uh, using the ideas I've been talking about today. So, here we are in the uh, Copenhagen problem with equal masses. There's L4. The first thing we do is we use this parameterization method of uh, Cabri Fontique and De La Ave, uh, my former supervisor, to approximate, to do a nice uh, approximation of these stable and unstable manifolds to get us away from the equilibrium. I'll mention also this book by Alex Haro because I won't go into a ton of details for the parameterization method. I just want to say that what it comes down to is solving a certain equation. And like you often do in celestial mechanics, we solve it with a, a formal power series. Uh, uh, we try to do some formal series expansion of the solution of this equation. And we can do that up, up to uh, nth order, just deriving recursion relations uh, that define the coefficients, the, new co the nth coefficient in terms of the n minus one. And doing that, we could compute a polynomial expansion to any order we like. Of course, we're using a computer, so at some point we have to stop. We take that polynomial as our approximate solution, and then we go through this whole uh, newton kantorovich argument, which is very much like what I did for a, just a 2D system earlier, although the estimates are more involved. That gives us the manifolds. Uh, once we have these local manifolds, we need to solve a boundary value problem like this. We want to flow from the blue curve, the boundary of the unstable manifold to the boundary of the stable. And we can write that as an equation, uh, which we can solve numerically with some Newton method. And we kind of recover uh, Stromgren's homoclinic here. 
Uh, we really use multiple shooting because we need to do to make this a proof now. We use the same uh, newton kantorovich type argument that I showed earlier. Now we need to do these time steps with rigorous integrators. And we want the time step to not be 12, but maybe 12 divided by 600 here. And the, the rigorous integrator is really used you know, we, we use the same kind of reasoning I just showed you for the manifolds. We do a formal expansion of the, of the uh, solution. We can get recursion for the coefficients. That gives us an approximate solution to whatever we, order we want. And then we, we do some a posteriori analysis uh, to show that the tail exists and is bounded and, and uh, it, it works very much like what we did for the manifolds. And we can get a proof uh, that this connecting orbit exists, the C0 norm on the whole thing, less than 10 to the minus 10. And our setup is done in such a way that we get automatically the transversality. Okay, so that's nice because now the forcing kicks in. So we, we prove this uh, one orbit is there. The transversality gives us the existence of chaotic motions. It gives us the... Uh, a tube of periodic orbits that accumulates to, accumulates to this and so on. Um, so this, uh, you know, I was thinking th th this is really, if you ask me what's the hardest computer assisted proof you've ever done, this wouldn't be anywhere near the list. It's, it's actually done, it's a fairly simple one with kind of standard tools, but I really like it because it has this nice long story, you know, going back, uh, roughly 100 years to this work in Copenhagen and then through the refinement by uh, Stromgern in the 60s when the, when the computer came on the scene, the digital computer. And then, then now it's, it's, you know, it's, I wouldn't call it an exercise, but it's, it's not, the, the, the state of the art has advanced to the point that something like this can be done um, relatively, uh, you know, it's, I don't want to say easy, but it's it's well within in grasp, right? Um, but it, it settles old questions, which is nice. Okay, so I have other pictures of other proofs. Things, you know, get even harder when you pass near collisions, and, and we use uh, regularization and Levi-Civita coordinates and things like this. So this can now be combined with everything you know you should be doing to, to do more and more interesting things, right? Connecting uh, collisions to the stable and unstable manifolds or doing ejection collision orbits and things like this. Um, I'll fly through this, right? This was a, a, a picture that we've kind of recovered almost from the from Moulton setting. I just I want to end by saying um, a plug for this seminar that we organize on computer assisted proofs every week. And if you go to the website, you can register to get the emails. This is uh, Jean-Philippe Lassard and J.B. Vandenberg and myself have been doing this for about the past year. And I mention it because there are a lot more talks here about computer-assisted proof, more than 50 now, many of them about celestial mechanics. So there's a, a wonderful talk by Alizond that Alessandra gave a few weeks ago and uh, Warwick Tucker talked about what relative equilibrium in much more detail than what I've done today. Shane Kepley talked about some of the things I've talked today, but actually finding uh, these uh, connections and knowing that you have the shortest ones and so on. Uh, Renato Calieja gave a talk about uh, torus knot choreography, spatial torus knots in the end body problem. Macek has given another beautiful talk there about diffusion. And I gave a talk there a little while ago where I talked about similar things of today, but in, in maybe much more detail. So if people are kind of interested in the details, you could go here. Uh, I have some slides about kind of the history here, things that have been done, many invariant tori, many of the things in this dynamical roadmap now, this is to, to kind of conclude, these things can actually be proven and with computer assisted proof. There's a really rich literature on this, all the symbolic dynamics um, going back, you know, more than 20 years, this has become a quite well-developed uh, field. Okay. Last thing to say, of course, thank you very much for the invitation to talk today. This was a, an incredible honor and thank you everyone for listening.